Chapter 17. Social Motivation, or It's Time We Talked. Have you ever heard of an intervention? This is basically when your friends and family gang up on you to convince you that you have a problem that needs addressing. Perhaps it'll be your co-workers. Maybe it'll be the police or a judge. It might be your community or neighbors. Maybe your boss is trying to tell you what you need to change so that you can keep working in your position. Maybe they're right. Or maybe they can just go stuff their complaints in their pie hole. Maybe your little kids are just crazy wild and bonkers and none of your friends ever had the guts to tell you until they all decided behind your back that, yes, you need to step in and rein in the little ones a bit better. Perhaps you are finally getting told that your breath reeks and you need to stop storing your clothes in mothballs because being smelly isn't socially acceptable. Maybe your wife has told you for years you should quit drinking because you're an awful drunk and now your kids are telling you the same thing. This is information you need to carefully consider. Sometimes it'll be a good friend, sometimes a parent, sometimes it's a formal meeting at your house, sometimes it's a conversation over a cup of coffee, sometimes it'll be a mentor, sometimes it'll be an employer. Whatever it is, love needs to be the primary motivator. If it's not, be careful. Because the choices of an individual or a small group can affect the whole group, life, not just humans, developed the use of shaming, shunning, and embarrassing those who behave poorly. It works but it's also hard to put an appropriate limit to it or use it correctly. It's easy to go too far while using it, or to be too free in dispensing it. As Americans, we're trying to curtail its usage, but we're terrible at it. We call out slut-shaming or fat-shaming or the like, but we publicly crucify anyone who misspeaks on Twitter. A few men got caught mansplaining recently and the internet just about blew up. Shaming is still as prevalent as ever, maybe even more so now with social media and our interconnections. A young woman makes a poorly chosen caption on Instagram for only friends or family to see, and within hours, hundreds of thousands of strangers can tell her how awful she is. Love needs to be the motivator and the method. But wait, this gives everyone license to criticize everything about anyone as long as we love them, right? Yes and no. Yes, because we are all supposed to help each other. No, because it needs to be done with tact, care, love, patience, and all of that good stuff. Timing can be everything. Wording can be everything. In the book, Crucial Conversations, make it safe is the mantra. However you confront someone about something, do it in a way that they can still feel safe and unthreatened dealing with this new information that requires some change from them. It's a fantastic book with lots of other good ideas. Go get it now or actually after you finish reading this book. John Gottman's book, The Seven Principles of Making a Marriage Work, is geared towards married couples but there is some fantastic advice in there about discussing touchy, emotionally charged subjects with anyone. When you have to tell someone something awkward, keep it simple, factual, and specific. Don't get sidetracked by distracting topics or defensive attitudes or insults thrown back at you. Give the other person a way out or something they can blame their problem on so that the other person isn't as likely to take it personally or get embarrassed. For example, you've been doing a great job here. We all love having you on our team. I don't think anyone ever mentioned to you the correct order for accomplishing this task. I want to talk to you about it and see if we can help you do it even better. What if someone tells you that you need to shape up, but they do it in a less than tactful way? What if they're jerks about it? What if they're wrong? Do we get off scot-free from having to fix ourselves just because they weren't careful about how they said it? No. Just because you got offended at having your imperfections shown to you by someone else doesn't put the responsibility on them. You still need to change yourself if you need to change yourself. And what if it's just their opinion? You would do well to listen carefully and at least give serious thought to the opinions of your family, spouse, friends, coworkers, and yes, even sometimes strangers. Doesn't mean you have to do it, but you should at least consider it before dismissing it outright. Interventions, crucial conversations, and honest opinions are part of the social motivation realm of things that can influence us. We feel motivated to change because others around us want us to. Again, if you need to hold an intervention, do it in a way that makes the other person feel safe. Discuss only the facts, even if those facts are your feelings, such as, when you behave that way, it makes me feel disrespected. Be open to conversations, validate their feelings, and make sure you can express your own without attacking their personality. Keep it focused on the outward problem, not the personality. Telling someone, the reason why you spend so much money is because you're so pig-headed about everything. 
has never done much good. Instead, how about this? When you bought that jet ski, you spent money that we needed for our medical bills. That throws off a lot of our other plans and makes things complicated. How's that for an example? See what I did there? Focus on the facts and details, not the personality problems of the other person. When we blame another person's poor decisions on some basic personality flaw, it's called, officially, a fundamental attribution error. We tell ourselves that person did a bad thing because they are a bad person. Look, we all make mistakes, even though we are all, basically and usually, good people. We need to avoid the temptation to think that those people are worse than us. This is easier said than done, and for those who master it, life is much less stressful. Whichever side of the conversation you are on, do your best to keep it calm. If you feel yourself starting to get excited, that's your go system taking over, your fight and flight adrenaline pumped system, and your thinking will start to suffer. You're getting flooded with hormones and emotions. Refocus your attention on the task and goal, not on your emotions or the other person's. If you need to, ask for a break before you continue the conversation, or look for a way to lighten the mood just a bit, to de-escalate the tension. Work an inside joke or a fond memory into the conversation, or an expression of love or camaraderie. If you're in the wrong, admit it quickly and change your wording. Most of my apologies go completely ignored by people who get upset with me, because I give them so easily and quickly, but they're still there, and I've learned to point them out when I get attacked for not admitting my faults. Then, when they see that I did admit my wrongs, they feel safer having an honest dialogue, too. Lots of times, we already know what we are doing wrong ourselves, and when someone actually tells us out loud to our faces, no matter how nicely they do it, we can't stand having to smell our own turd, so to speak. A natural reflex is to withdraw or respond with anger. We can go from a loving friend or family member into a defensive or offensive opponent within milliseconds. It takes a great deal of courage to admit that they are right. It gets easier the more you do it. Catch yourself from getting defensive and making excuses, or explaining away all your reasons for being your dumb self. Putting up those walls between your loved ones and yourself takes work to pull down later. Most people don't like doing it, because they don't like making themselves more vulnerable than they already are. Fixing the original problem is hard enough. Having to fix and repair walls and relationships you put between them only compounds the problem. The gist, trust each other. Chapter 18. Rock Bottom, or Feeling the Pain of Consequences Every addict who's ever acknowledged their addiction and every person who's felt the need to change and improve has hit some sort of rock bottom. That's the point where the pain of the addiction or problem was finally bad enough to push them into getting help. Many people will have several rock bottoms, and no rock bottom is ever the worst that it can get. It can always get worse. In a classic comic strip from Calvin and Hobbes, Bill Watterson uses Calvin hanging from a balloon way above the ground, imagining all the things that could make his situation worse, to observe, that's one of the remarkable things about life. It's never so bad that it can't get worse. Whether it's losing a loved one, injuring yourself, an intervention held in your honor, a moment of sobriety between binges, maybe it's a good long look in the mirror and not liking what you see, rock bottom is where we get our personal motivation to change. We don't like where we are at. We get busy living or we get busy dying. It's a moment of choice. I've known folks who've hit rock bottoms while dumpster diving for girly magazines behind the liquor store, or hiding underneath cars to evade a suspicious police officer outside of a pharmacy. Others found it on their way to jail, or simply realizing they won't get to participate in a religious ceremony because of worthiness issues. Like the biblical prodigal son who realizes he's eating pig slop when he could be eating at his wealthy father's home, it's when we finally breach our own personal morals and snap out of it enough to get help. Don't count on hitting a rock bottom to get help. If you know you should get it, count that as your rock bottom, because the actual bottom is way, way, way down there, and often involves death or loss of all your personal freedom. But that's a gruesome thought. Let's get back up a few levels to things like rehab and detoxifying. Those may feel like death, but they are far, far from it. So remember, it can always get worse. Chapter 19. Rehabilitation and Detoxifying Back to Health Rehab and Detox I don't mean the detox like health food stores promote. You know, the kind where mysterious, accumulated, unnamed, undiscovered toxins get purged from your body's cells by eating some sort of unhealthily extreme diet. 
There's a place for those, but I'm talking about the real serious kinds of detox. Oftentimes, pent-up emotions and unresolved traumatic memories can inhibit constructive thinking and healing. They can manifest themselves as health problems. It's crazy, but there's some truth to it. Emotional problems can, and often do, cause physical problems. Whether it's because we've turned to unhealthy habits or foods to feel better, or ignored healthy behavior because of depression, anxiety, or the like. Yes, changing our diet and lifestyle can have some improvements and help us take some early steps towards lasting change. More often, though, we need to develop healthy emotional habits and ways of thinking, and the other good habits will follow. If there is some behavior, substance, habit, thought, or emotion that has held control over your lifestyle, oftentimes the first thing to do is find a way to get away from it long enough that your prefrontal cortex, the thinking and reasoning part of your brain, can take full control again. Rehab facilities specialize in this. Usually you enter some clinic, facility, or hospital where you cannot get access to the thing that's been bothering you. Your body and mind go through some usually painful chemical, hormonal, or emotional withdrawals while the remnants of the drug of choice gets worked out of your system. There's a popular myth that it takes 28 days for this to occur. It goes along with the idea that it takes 30 days to form a new habit. Neither of these is always true, but it's a good start, and that idea has helped many, many people. It could take 60 or 90 days. Rewiring your brain, carving new ruts and pathways for the thoughts to flow like water, can take a long time. It could really take years to get the full effect, but since most people can't spend years in some care facility, they are there to give you a good push start in the right direction, teach you some new ideas and habits, help you overcome mental and emotional hurdles that held you back before, and then send you on your way back into the wild world of life. A good program won't just drop you back into life on your own, but give you support, tools, and help, slowly, a little bit at a time, as you can handle it. Any newly sprouted tree will crush under the weight of an unruly kid playing on it, but a large, mature, strong tree can have houses and forts built into its branches easily. What we struggle with early on will not always be struggles later. We will do well to remember that and let ourselves grow slowly with the help from our friends. If the thing you need to avoid is a person or group of people that are pushing you into bad stuff, one of the hardest things you'll have to do is get away from that social circle. Sometimes that will mean leaving your home, moving away, and escaping that toxic environment. As you try to give something up that you've emotionally depended on for a long time, those emotions will surface, in full force, and you will likely be an awful person to be around for a while until you are taught or learn to rein those emotions in in constructive ways. This is how some people get caught while trying to push along their own recovery by themselves. It's when this stuff surfaces that people think they're starting to abuse if they didn't already know. But just like those detox diets I mentioned earlier, abstaining from them for an extended period of time gives your brain a chance to start kicking all that stuff to the curb. It's not enough to just go through withdrawals. You and your loved ones, whether it's you or your loved ones, it doesn't matter, will need to learn the right way to act to replace your drug or habit of choice. You'll need to learn the right ways to deal with your negative emotions. That takes outside help. If you could have solved it on your own, you already would have. Don't turn down help from other people. Suck it up and give in and let them help you. In truth, once an addiction or habit has formed, it has created a pathway. It has created a rut in your mind that will likely be there the rest of your life, though it may not always. It will always be easy to fall back into old ways. That is where a good support system, a counselor, constructive habits that bring lasting happiness, and principles taught by various 12-step programs work into our lives. If we get our social groups and the environment around us on our side and stay determined even after we mess up, it's hard to lose. So in short, take out the garbage. Get rid of it. Chapter 20. Social Support. We get by with a little help from our friends. It's extremely difficult to get a personal change to stick without the help of our friends and family and coworkers and neighbors. When we form any kind of relationship with someone, we fit into these molds, these slots or labels that we attach to others and ourselves when we're around others. That helps save brain power to give ourselves these shortcuts to use as we interact with other people. But at times, they can be traps. How many of us return home for the holidays and find ourselves getting stuck back into the role of little brother or bossy sister, no matter what's actually changed in our separate lives? When we make an effort to change ourselves, it is wise to enlist the help of those who care about us. If we're friends with the group that steps outside to have a smoke, we'll lose that relationship to a degree. 
but will either reform that relationship in a healthier way or form new relationships. Find those we trust and tell them what you're trying to accomplish. Ask for their help. Most of the time, they'll be understanding and encouraging, even if they can't be directly helpful. Be honest, humble, and sincere when you approach them. Don't let them put you down, but let them be honest in return. In Napoleon Hill's famous book, Think and Grow Rich, he goes on and on about mastermind groups and the role they played in just about every millionaire and inventor that's ever lived. Ed Catmull describes at length in his book, Creativity Incorporated, the efforts that the leaders of Pixar, like himself, took to create honesty and openness among their movie makers. They had a candor that let them make so many high-quality and well-loved films. They often held and had regular meetings where everyone involved was encouraged to be frank and honest in their thoughts regarding a scene or a dialogue. It let them fail in safe ways without investing too much time and effort into the failure. Thomas Edison was not some lone inventor tinkering away in a lab. At times, he had up to 30 people with him in his lab, working out some idea or invention, failing thousands of times along the way as they shared ideas and effort. Every support group and 12-step group in existence is a mastermind group of sorts. Family councils fill a similar role. These groups not only give us motivation to improve, but often the ability and answers to our problems we need. If we want to ensure that you will find improvement, you will need to find some way to interact with others regarding your improvement. For some, this comes easy. For some, it will be the hardest part. Depending on your personal level of motivation and ability, our personality, our past, and our upbringing, we will either be ecstatic to join a group or terrified to death of it. For those of you terrified of such a proposition, I promise it is not as scary as it seems, and it gets easier very quickly. I've watched a great many recovering addicts enter a room, sheepish and timid, sit quietly in a chair, pass when it comes their turn to speak, and slip out quietly at the end. I've personally witnessed dozens and dozens of people tell their stories about how scary it was to walk through the door the first time, then tell how it got easier by the second and third, then how much they enjoyed coming to meetings and looked forward to meetings after just a short while. If they keep coming, it's not long before they find themselves opening up, sharing their fears and emotions, proclaiming their successes, and even giving encouragement to others. Our brain and our body are designed to enjoy social interaction, though many of us have either not practiced it or become socially obese and gotten rusty at conversing with others. Some of us were brought up in a home that didn't help us with it or discouraged social development. With repetition and effort and practice, those pathways in our brain will open up. Social hormones and love hormones, serotonin and oxytocin, will begin flowing quickly, and with practice and smoothing out some rough edges, we'll have a nice river of sociality flowing through our mind that we'll enjoy a great deal and will overflow into the rest of our lives. The hardest part is finding social environments that we can participate in often and regularly. It's hard to find group settings where we are comfortable and where we can improve, not indulge in our weaknesses. Bars and clubs attract a lot of people. A great deal of our society's sociality exists in those settings, but they have their limits, mostly because people there tend to be under the influence of some substance or the overwhelming sensory stimulation, the lights and sounds, overwhelming our ability to think clearly. We won't be thinking our best in a situation like that. Clothing stores, bars, and clubs sometimes use this to their advantage, sometimes even churches, too. We need to add other types of groups to our mix, service clubs, community organizations, volunteering, faith-based groups, hobby groups, and more. Like not putting our eggs in one basket or putting all your retirement savings on one company's stock. Having a variety of groups we interact with rounds us out the best. In college, even after I'd made up my mind to go into medicine and dentistry, I kept taking civil engineering seminar classes just because I did enjoy being around engineers and not just future doctors. I knew a husband and wife in Duncan, B.C., Canada, that each belonged to different chapters of Rotary International just to expand their social circle together. Your circumstances will be different than anyone else's, and your wants and desires, strengths, weaknesses, and goals will help you figure out what you should do. Our society and species thrives by working together toward a common goal. If or when we face a world-shattering apocalypse that destroys Western civilization, those preppers who entrench themselves into their underground shelters or disappear into the woods may survive. But those who jump right back into rebuilding society by adding their talents to the mix will allow society to bounce right back within a short period. Thus, we won't just survive, we will thrive. Like a net or web, when we find attachments to those around us, not as much can destroy us or finish us off. We are stronger together. 
we should still be careful of those we attach ourselves to. Our friends influence us for better or worse, and while flocking birds can be of a different feather, those we flock with tend to shape us into who we will become. To put it briefly, choose your friends well. Chapter 21 Environmental Ability and Motivation Change the World Around You Sometimes, even with the best of friends and support groups, or with the pressures of personal motivation cracking the whip at us to change, or even with all the knowledge and ability in the world, we will still mess up. We will still fail. Like I mentioned in the first half of this book, sometimes our reptilian brain, our survival brain, our go system dominates over our civilized brain, our no system. And there's just not much we can do to fight a strong temptation when we find ourselves alone faced with our weakness. Or perhaps we find ourselves in a crowd of passionate people all going the wrong direction, doing wrong or destructive things. The answer? Get away from your weakness or get it away from you. Change your environment. If you want to exercise but can't get yourself to the gym, try getting your own gym equipment at home and put it right in the middle of your life where you can't ignore it. Tucking it into the empty corner of the basement may not be the best idea. What if it's hard to get up and run in the morning? Put your clothes on the floor right in your way so you have to trip over them and change into them without even having to think. Do you have trouble not hitting the snooze button for the 15th time every morning? Put your alarm clock across the room where you have to get up and walk somewhere to turn it off, preferably by the bedroom or bathroom door where you can just keep walking the same direction away from the bed towards the shower or kitchen. What if you don't care enough to turn it off and are just fine with it buzzing away over there? Get a clock loud enough it might wake up your family or neighbors. They'll hate you if you leave it going more than a couple beeps and you'll feel that pressure to jump out of bed to turn it off. Want to quit smoking out the back door? Don't use the back door anymore. Want to quit speeding to work? Set your alarm just a few minutes earlier so you don't have to feel rushed. Or set an alarm five minutes before the time you need to be walking out the door. Want to learn about medicine? Go hang out at a doctor's office or hospital and ask to shadow the experts there. Want to stop wasting time on social media on your phone, which is always in your pocket? Uninstall the app from your phone so you can only check it on a desktop computer. Or get another time management app that limits your Facebook or Instagram usage to some time limit you're okay with. Want to quit drugs? Avoid the friends who help you get them, or who you do drugs with. Most of us can alter the world around us to a large degree. If you want to make it easy to change and need that extra motivation from the world around you, change your environment. Change your bedroom, change your home, change your commute, change your office or job if needed. Propinquity is the state of being near something. In psychology, it means that you'll do or take care of or participate in what's near you. If you don't want something around, get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it, move yourself away. Feng Shui is the philosophy that your environment affects your emotions. It may have some good ideas for you. What if you've changed all that but still can't stay away? Put reminders around you. Use a reminder app on your phone to check on yourself. Put sticky notes where you can't miss them and won't easily ignore them as they pile up around your computer monitor at work. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, was a big fan of personal planners or day planners before smartphones existed. Write goals or assignments down. Give them a due date. Stick to that due date. Deal with it when it's in front of you. Work with your environment and let your environment work with you. If you want trick-or-treaters coming to your door on Halloween so you can show off all your cool decorations, don't live out in the country. Find some suburban neighborhood with a bajillion kids, pick a house on a through street, not a cul-de-sac, and use lots of cool lights to get their attention. Do you want to avoid trick-or-treaters at all costs? Go live out in the country with a really long driveway and barely any markers or signs that you live there. That'll also save you from having to take care of your lawn and put up Christmas decorations. If you need help keeping your home clean, make it a habit to invite friends and neighbors over for dinner and a game night so you feel the pressure to clean your living room and guest bathroom once in a while. Can't stop eating those snacks in your cupboard? Stop buying them. It's hard to eat snacks that aren't there. Or learn to make your favorite snacks. That way you'll make them healthier, hopefully and the work involved in making them will burn some calories as well as keeping you from making too many of them or doing it too often, again, hopefully. What if you just can't stop criticizing your kids? What if you just can't leave them alone to make their own mistakes and learn on their own and grow up and mature into a great adult? Give them some alone time. Leave them be for certain periods of time. Find someone else who will watch them in an appropriate, constructive way. 
Bring someone else into your home or your life that can teach you what to do. Read, learn, practice. Do you constantly feel stressed at work or at home? Take a look into the psychology of color and learn how lighting, texture, and color can affect your mood. Read up on organization techniques and time management skills and build those things into your home and office that will reduce that stress you're feeling. Of course, all of these decisions have to be made when you're thinking clearly, when you've had a few moments of sobriety when life is all satisfied and good. Have the courage to put those limits in place or those changes made so that when you encounter your addiction, your weakness, your bad habit, your stressor, you've got rules made for yourself and you don't have to make that decision in the moment. It was already made by you by a more clear-headed version of you. I'm going to go on a tangent right now. It's a bit related. I'm going out on a limb to discuss it. I'm sure many people will take issue with how I describe it and what my suggestions are for this problem. That's fine. I can't please everyone. I hope that whoever dislikes what I'm about to say takes the time to be thoughtful and disagree not on principle or semantics, how I say it. Ready? Let's go. Much is said about modesty. Yep, trigger alert. We're going there. There are plenty of men and women who preach modesty to protect people from sexual assault or to help men and women avoid improper thoughts. If we all dressed more conservatively, there would be fewer problems between the genders. There are also plenty of men and women who feel the opposite, that women and men should be able to dress however they like and it's up to the observer to control their thoughts and their behaviors. To insinuate that women are mistreated because of their appearance is to promote rape culture. Both sides are correct. This is a hard topic to discuss and there's no right answer. There's no place to draw a boundary for what is modest or not. It's no fault of a woman if a man attacks her, however she is dressed. Yes, when people are dressed modestly, it is less of a biological and instinctive trigger, and yes, everyone needs to be responsible for their own thoughts and their own actions. There will always be a spectrum of dress standards across cultures and environments. There is huge variation and variety of what people are used to seeing and what they consider immodest. That huge variation is also what gets us into trouble. Not all people are used to seeing so much skin. And like I pointed out early in this book, skin is an instinctive biological trigger for certain behaviors and hormones. Like every person on this planet, how we dress ourselves is the right way. Those who show off more than us are trashy, and those who show off less than us are prudes. This goes along with our driving habits. Everyone who drives faster than us is a maniac who cares nothing about safety, and everyone who drives slower than us is an idiot. We judge everyone else from our own perspective. It's all we can do. We can try to broaden our perspective, but all of our opinions of this world and universe have one unifying thread, ourself. Avoiding the triggers that spark the hormonal and instinctive behaviors that all people are vulnerable to is a team effort. We all need to learn to control ourselves and our thoughts. We also all need to learn to be conscious of how we appear and the kind of effect it might have on others. There's no line in the sand that we can draw. There are no boundaries that will fit all places, times, or circumstances. There can't be. Clothing of some form has been present on humanity since we became a species, whenever that was. As soon as humans appeared on the earth, they were wearing something, and it covered the genitals and reproductive organs. Even other hominid species likely wore some kind of clothing before we showed up on this earth. Naturalists like to think that nudity is natural, when it actually isn't. Clothing is the natural state of our species. Clothing is used for practical reasons like warmth, protection, etc. But it doesn't take much clothing to meet those needs. A skin, pelt, or plain blanket will work for that. Anything beyond that is some sort of expression of who we think we are. We wear subdued clothing to show our humility. We wear extravagant clothing to show our amazing style or our wealth. We wear uniforms to show solidarity and unity, hence the uni meaning one in uniform. We wear bright colors to influence our mood and the mood of those we'll meet. We wear black to show our grief and help others join us in our sadness. We wear tight clothing to feel sexy and attractive, or to be supportive for lots of movement. We wear shiny clothes to attract attention, or dull colors when we want to avoid it. We wear intimidating clothing to make us feel stronger and to project that image to others. We wear clothes to assert our social rank, or we wear whatever we feel like and get stuck in whatever social rank we didn't care to choose for ourselves, often not a helpful one. Clothing has just as much of an effect on ourselves as it does on those who see us. It stirs our own thoughts and imagination, and it triggers that in others who see us in it. We act differently when we wear different clothing. I've had fun going to dental conferences dressed casually, or very professionally from one day to the next, 
and noting the difference in how the sales reps and other doctors treat and respond to me. Waiters and waitresses will treat us differently based on our dress, and we treat them differently based on theirs. No one likes to admit that they do it. No, of course not. We're all much more civilized than that. Except that we aren't. Even the best of us has to fight that instinct to judge people on their appearance, because it's a useful instinct that has helped us survive for a really long time. The fact that I can even talk about this and you can understand this speaks to the power we have as a species to overcome our instincts with effort. This conversation, this issue of modesty, has been around since before recorded history. It will go on forever. The truth of the matter is, a person who's looking to aggressively satisfy a sexual impulse will more likely pick someone who's showing more sexuality in their appearance than the average person for that culture or that setting. Just like a car thief will more likely pick a car that's easier to steal. 1980s and 1990s Hondas, hmm? But no one wants to be less than averagely attractive, so it's no surprise that people want to look their best. There is no defending a human being who sexually assaults another. That person acts on their own instincts. So we're caught in a tricky situation, a delicate balancing act, a fine line, a razor's edge. We need to make our own personal decision and understand that they are our own. We hold aggressors responsible for their own actions, and we understand that we can help each other, sometimes by dressing out of respect for ourselves and out of respect for those around us. Sometimes, as a community, a religious faith, a family, or as a society, we settle on and collectively decide what types of clothing we will accept and what types we won't. It's different for each group, and there are few hard fast rules about it, and it should be that way. We just need to be careful when we interact with each other with our different standards, and look at each other as humans first. Conservatives, or even religious adherents, are often criticized for having strict, limiting rules or commandments to follow often at the expense of some stimulating behavior or substance. Many, but definitely not all of these rules and commandments were set in place and followed by those with the clear head and foresight to see that there are a great many substances and habits that appear gentle on the surface but can be very destructive over a long period of time. Research shows that whether religious or not, having our own personal commandments that we live by is a huge step in overcoming weaknesses and problems. The late David Bowie gave an interview later in his career discussing his alcoholism. He had made a firm decision to never even have one alcoholic drink ever again. Alcohol became such a problem for him, and he learned enough about it and himself, that he decided he could not afford to take a chance to have even just a sip ever again, for fear of losing control over himself and relapsing into his old addictions and the habits and problems that come with it. His drinking had caused problems for himself and for many of his loved ones around him. It became important enough to make that rule for himself, and for their benefit, too. How do you think he kept that rule? Do you think he went and hung out in bars and clubs? Perhaps he had to as part of his career as a pop star. Perhaps that's what led to the problem in the first place. I don't really know, I'm speculating. But I also speculate that he eventually figured out what rules he had to make for himself. He learned the invisible fences he decided he would never cross, to keep himself safe. And with practice, he learned how to keep those fences there and not cross them, even when his thinking was less than clear. I gained a lot of respect for him after watching that interview. It's a great example of someone who has recovered from a serious addiction and the humility and growth that accompanies it. In a distilled form, change your world.